Welcome. It's the 10th week uh, we've been doing these lockdown videos. Um, I'm Dr. Phil Parker. Welcome to this. We're, we're going to be covering a whole range of stuff. Now, whether you're watching it live, as I know many people do, or if you're one of the literally tens of thousands of people who watch it on Catch Up, welcome. If you want to add comments, please drop them down. Uh, in the live version, obviously, I'll, I'll uh, respond to, but it's really valuable to have your, your comments as you watch it afterwards as well. <clears throat> And we're going to particularly be looking at uh, dealing with stress today, how to remain calm in the continuing disruption to our normal life. So if that's something of interest to you, that's what we're going to be covering. Uh, I'm getting a few messages of people joining. Good to see you guys. Uh, did you miss us last week? I know quite a few people have let me know that they uh, their normal uh, experience of getting together on a Tuesday has been missing. Uh, so welcome back. Um, and we're planning to carry on doing this for as long as we can. So please tell everybody about it. It's it's great that you've shared it with so many people. Literally, you know, uh, I think each one has had about about ten thousand views. So the numbers are, are, are swelling as we as we help people to get through what's a very difficult time in life. So. Uh, <clears throat> If you have questions that you think I really would like Phil to, to answer how I deal with this particular issue, and you can keep it anonymous. If you don't want to leave it as a comment, just send us an email to phil at philparker.org and say, please don't mention my name. But uh, if you could talk through this and how we deal with this, then I'm happy to do that too. Um, but your questions really help to shape and frame what we'll be talking about. I've got loads of stuff I could talk about. Uh, I was doing a lecture just the other day. <clears throat> And you know the range of stuff that I work with from uh, people in some of the most uh, successful businesses in the world, um, peak performers in golf and sport, uh, premiership footballers, Oscar winners, um, Grammy award winners, uh, all the way down to people who are seriously ill, can't function in their lives, and to people who live under bridges injecting themselves with street drugs. We, we work with all that kind of stuff. There's a range of stuff, obviously, that I could talk about. The question is, what's useful for you guys? So let us know what's on your mind, what's, uh, what's a pressing issue for you at this point if you're watching live. If you're watching on Catch Up, you can also leave a comment, comment as well. We'll, we will look at them and, uh, and use them in future uh, broadcasts. Or, as I say, send me an, an email phil, at philparker.org. So that's that stuff just to help uh, shape what we're doing welcome everybody good to see you i hope you are doing well um today is a strange day uh, for those of you watching it live we're in america is in the midst of some of the most extreme circumstances it's seen for a long time because not only have we got covid which is you know uh, you know the biggest pandemic since 1918 also, they've got the biggest race riots since the 1960s and the biggest financial issue since uh, 1929. So all coming together, they're in quite a, a strange place. And of course, they've got the lovely Mr. Trump in charge trying to resolve that with his normal brilliance. So um, if you're watching from the States, we are sending you love and, and hope and uh, kindness towards each other. And that's one of the things I'm going to be talking about today is about how we deal with other people. <clears throat> because here we are in uh, a continuing lockdown experience where we are limited in who we can be with, often working from home, bumping into the same people who we probably love dearly, hopefully. Uh, but after two, three months, that's quite an unusual situation to find yourself in. So dealing with other people, we're going to be talking about that. <clears throat> and also dealing with uh, other people because we're going to start to bump into other people as we move into either virtual conversations with them or real physical conversations. So we head back towards work or, or socially connecting with them. And some of those people won't be in very good shape because they've been um, you know, isolated, climbing the walls, dealing with all sorts of stuff. So they may not be on their best behavior. Um, you will also find that uh, there may be a kind of a, what's the word a concentration like a uh, like uh, like the the water in the sea becoming a little bit saltier. Uh, people just the less people to see more stuff going on. So we're going to talk a little bit about some interesting ways of thinking about other people. <clears throat> Excellent, we've got some questions coming in. We've gone about sabotaging weight loss um, and straying off diet. Uh, support for looking at sadness in the USA yeah um, absolutely <clears throat> so I guess something I talk about on most of these calls 
here's the serenity prayer which is probably a good place to start as always to remind ourselves that the three points of the serenity prayer number one is uh, change the thing we things we can and actually you may know the serenity prayer was was written or devised by an activist uh, who was actually a priest uh, or a minister of god in northern states of america but he was also very radical in his political persuasions and he said if you see injustice you need to do something about it so change the things you can change not just have a go he said it's like it, you it, there's a requirement for you to do that to change the things you can change and then secondly to accept the things you cannot change and as we know thirdly the wisdom to know the difference and we put so much of our time and energy into things we can't change um so i often think about bob geldof um and and the whole live aid thing where he's sitting at sitting at home watching tv and he sees these kids in africa you know starving uh and he could have been sad about it he probably was but more importantly than his emotional response was the action he took that he decided well i'm in a position where i can do something about this now we can't all do that kind of thing that he did but we can do stuff so thinking about what could we do <clears throat> got a question about the law of attraction uh which has also come up i'll talk about that a little bit as well um <clears throat> so in terms of the american thing uh at the moment what can we do if we're not in America, there's a limited amount of things that we can do apart from reach out to our friends in America. We can make sure we stand up for things that we think are not okay and speak up about that for sure. Uh, because as I say, silence is also part of a collaboration of the status quo. Uh, but it's also important not to have wasted emotions about it. So if we just feel really upset about it and that doesn't transform into any action, that's not really any point to that it's like if you see something you think i don't i'm not okay with that it's like thinking okay well how can i transform that into something i can do something about and there may be sometimes you can't uh, and that's okay as well you know that you, you can't fix everything we have to do what we can do um so let's look next at this question about weight loss um i know that for a lot of people uh, they've been hiding the scales as they've been sitting around in uh, in their pajamas uh eating snacks or, or not exercising or just being in the same you know i mean just even the kind of you know walk to the station or taking the kids to the school all that kind of stuff has just stopped so it is a big problem for a lot of people i know um anybody else there uh commenting uh, who's noticed that their weight is not quite as they uh, want it to be or maybe the elves have been in the cupboard and just sewing their trousers a little bit tighter than they did the day before if you've noticed that and you want to share that please do it's a common thing a couple of things you can do around this i mean there's loads you can do but <clears throat> one of the first things i really would recommend you do is when you reach for those foods that you know uh, you're eating not because you're hungry but because it's you know it's been driven by something else whether it's comfort or boredom or they just taste nice pause for a minute and ask yourself this really important question <clears throat> which is what do i actually want what do i really want what do i genuinely want and when you pause in that moment and reflect and really ask yourself that question what do i really want i want the biscuit it's like no, what, what do i really want and spend a few moments with that you'll recognize that what's driving that behavior is not the need for the calories it's not the need for the food stuff it's not you're hungry it's something else and then you want to ask yourself okay well how can i get that in a different way that's more healthy for me so if it's like i want to have some fun <clears throat> then what other ways could there be to have fun if it's like I want some comfort or some nurturing, what other ways are there to be nurtured that might be more useful for you, more healthy for you, and won't make you feel crappy about yourself later on? <clears throat> um, another thing to do, simple thing to do, don't buy stuff. <laughs> don't buy stuff that you know is troublesome for you. When you go to the supermarket or the shops or you order it online, just don't buy it. Don't have it in the house. If it's not in the house, you can't eat it. If you have to have it in the house for other people, then put it in a cupboard that's that's not your cupboard and that you know as many of you know i'm a vegetarian I, there's certain aisles in the supermarket i just don't go down there's nothing in there for me it's meat i'm not interested uh, and 
and the same with the milk I just don't it's not where I go so uh, you could put it in a, in a different cupboard from the one that's your food cupboard you could put uh, every t- sometimes people put on the inside of the cupboard they put a picture you know that says stop or no or a more interesting picture of something they want to do rather than the food so if you open the cupboard and uh, the biscuits there's a picture of you looking at the, the weight that you want to be in so there's some stuff you can do around that if you find by doing that you're not getting the change you want and you need to speak to somebody because what's going on is something deeper but those things will start to shift those things so that those behaviors bringing them into consciousness is one of the most important things quite often we will snack and eat things without really thinking about it at all uh, there are some interesting techniques which uh, some people on the call have seen me do where you can create an aversion like a phobic response to certain foods my daughter's always appalled at me when I tell her about this uh, that I come back and say oh yeah help someone to f- have a fear of chocolate she's like what that's a, an awful thing to teach someone but it was requested people said I really like to not like chocolate and I think there's a video on YouTube um, of me talking through the process of how to develop an aversion to foods which is very effective um, I'm sure some people on the uh, on the comments will tell me things they've seen me getting getting people to uh, to dislike you know with their approval they say please can you teach me a uh, Jenny's one yeah it was was it chocolate was that a thing for you originally I think it was yeah uh, I remember somebody cr- did Chris one. Yeah, ah, oh, we are Renara. <laughs> Renara with Chris. I remember that one. <laughs> Since two thousand and twelve. Oh. so shares in Walkers and Frito Lay have probably gone down as a result of that. Uh, then we had a question about the law of attraction. So the law of attraction is a, a complex idea, in that the idea of the law of attraction is that what you put out comes back towards you so uh, it's kind of a bit like wish fulfillment and I don't spend too much time talking about it because it moves from basic sound neurology into things that are more difficult to evidence with any certainty but if we bring it back into um, science and neurology it's absolutely clear that what we expect so our expectancy our beliefs affect how we deal with the world so in a really simple level if you take a pill and you don't think it's going to work even though it's the right pill if you don't believe it's going to work or you don't believe the doctor who gave it to you the pill will not have the same effect as someone who really thinks this pill is exactly what they need uh, so if you've watched my interviews or listened to my interviews with uh, Professor Irving Kirsch, who's the founder of the theory of response expectancy, it's very clear the research is absolutely you know, solid that your expectations affect your physiology. So they affect not only how your brain works, but how your body responds to certain stuff. So if we bring it back down to that level, then yeah, absolutely, uh, we are attracting all sorts of responses we may or may not want by by what we put out there's a question that people have about the law of attraction They're like what well, so if you think really hard you'll get what you want uh, so does that mean therefore that uh, the people starving in Africa uh, it's because they're not attracting the thing they want and that's where it all becomes a bit tricky yeah and, and also would the universe really care if you've got a new Lexus you know what is the point in that so there's some other questions we're not going to go into that the law of attraction raises uh, it's something I know a fair bit about but it's not what I'm going to be talking about today uh, could you use the same tool for smoking yeah we're smoking and um, one of the things that, yeah no, Jenny's already said yes uh, we're smoking smoking is usually driven by some other need than smoke and most people who've ever experienced smoking when you first start to smoke you don't like it you have to work to love a smoke uh, as I did when I was a teenager uh, so it's not pleasant to start with for most people it's something they have to get over and then they get used to it and most of the issue around smoking is about the habit it's very it becomes very familiar behavior that you do and it gives you lots of things so it gives you a, a break 
you know, I'm just going to nip out for a fag you know, or a cigarette. It gives you uh, an opportunity to pause and think. It helps people to be more motivated and also more calm, which is very interesting because it can't do both those things. It can't be, make you very sharp and very chilled. Uh, although people claim it does, that's not the cigarette that's doing it, it's your neurology that's doing it. Uh, it helps you to be sociable, it helps you to be confident. It doesn't really do those things, but we recognize and connect those behaviors with smoking. So smoking becomes this whole thing that has a connection to all, all sorts of positive things. And when we give up smoking, we feel like we're losing all those really important things. So you have to find a way to still keep all the benefits that you had from smoking whilst not doing the smoking behavior. <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, a <coughs> couple of other questions can I talk about positivity versus realistic thinking Ooh, very good uh, did I get an email from Sarah about a nervous system being out of balance I don't think I did Sarah so if you can briefly put the comment down that will be helpful for me uh, whilst you're composing that brilliant uh, comment I will uh, just talk about positivity and realistic thinking so, is it always good to be positive about stuff? No, it's not. Um, what we need to do is to be able to have some kind of um, filter that is sensitive to, to context. So if somebody says, look, I've got five magic beans. Can, you know, do you want to swap your house for them? You probably want to go, well, how exactly how magic are the beans? What was the evidence these beans are magic before I hand over the, this lovely house? Um, it doesn't mean the beans may not be magic and better than your house, uh, but you want to be sure that's the case. You don't want to just go, oh, they seem like a nice person. I'm going to trust it. Uh, so that would be uh, an example of realistic thinking. Sometimes people do the opposite in that they think that any kind of positivity is unrealistic thinking. Uh, and you know there is a quote somewhere about uh, if you're not depressed then you haven't looked at life carefully enough you know that, that life is, gen is generally bad and awful uh, and, and that kind of realistic thinking is not very healthy for us because if we really take a non-trusting non-accepting not giving a little bit of uh, trust and leeway in people's good nature then that does give us a world where it feels everything's a bit difficult and a bit tricky. Um, and if you look at the news, you could you could buy into that, but we have to remember the news is not a realistic filter of reality. That is a very you know specific bit that you know they always have the happy you know if a cat was rescued by a fireman at the end of the news you know. But most of the rest of it is the bad stuff. That's the thing that news tends to tell us. So what is reality? Um, those of you who've seen the McGurk phenomenon uh, is a good example of uh, how we can reality can be quite distorted. Uh, I will post a link to the McGurk phenomenon. <coughs> uh, hi from Hong Kong, Jenny. I hope everything's going okay in Hong Kong and you are still uh, still with us. Uh, Uh, Kate has a question about knowledge retention. Do you want to tell me a bit more about that? And I may be able to answer it a little bit more clearly. Um, so while she's composing that text, knowledge retention, it could be information retention, but it could be recalled as there's two different things. There's how much you remember and how much you can access. Um, George Miller, a very famous uh, psychologist, said the maximum amount of information we can maintain uh, in one go consciously is seven pieces of information he actually said seven plus or minus two which means somewhere between five and nine and they did this with like shopping lists and when they kept on adding things to the shopping list when it got beyond about seven people started to forget the first thing um, but of course if you if you say some of the apples and oranges as one thing then people may remember that so you can actually have slightly more than seven uh, so it's more about uh, uh, retaining information and then recalling it um, <clears throat> one of the uh, one of the 
difficulties people often have about recalling information is about their belief again it comes back to expectancy if you believe you're rubbish at remembering things then you will be uh, it, it doesn't mean that you are bad at remembering things but that you'll go into it with a sense of i'm no good at this i can't remember this uh, and a lot of people have excellent memory recall for certain things so uh, i don't know about you kate but um so some people can remember what's what year a song was or um what people's kids are called or my sister is amazing she can remember phone numbers we had right from the 1970s you know she can still remember them even though we moved house every six months um because we were on on the run for the mafia no we weren't really we were in the army uh, but it sounded a bit more interesting <laughs> so <laughs> um, most people have a have recall in and, and, and retention in some area if they have it in one area then they should be able to recall it in in other areas but often they don't believe they can let's have a look what we got coming up um how can we increase our uh, our super brain how can we get more recall um <laughs> Vicky, I'll talk about that in a minute. Vicky wants to know, do you like the, the backdrop? Uh, I think I explained before the backdrop is pretend. It doesn't really <laughs> exist. I don't know if I can get it. There it is, gone. Um, it's not my, not even my room. Although there, used to, there was a little toy car, which I've edited out. I can't, oh no, it's still there. I haven't got the one that hasn't got the toy car on it. Uh, I also have the prison cell from Porridge and a, a, a pop, Top of the Pop studio from 1967, which sometimes I up uh jenny says i remember random facts but definitely believe i can't recall biosciences yeah if you can remember one thing you can remember another thing um so super brain improving retention and applying it um there's loads to talk about this but the thing i'd point you to which i found one of the most useful books bizarrely is darren brown's book um darren's brown book uh called trick tricks of the mind i think let's quickly look up what it's called tricks of the mind anyone know the answer to this is it tricks of the mind so the book was the trick of the mind tricks of the mind by uh, uh darren brown and just mentioning his name was enough for the internet to magically disappear uh, and something went wrong but i'll edit this so hopefully it'll be better for people watching it in uh in on a recap so um where do we get to yeah we're talking about being positive being positive all the time is that good um yeah it's not about being positive all the time or being negative it's not even wrong to complain sometimes or be realistic the question is is this useful for you in this moment <clears throat> is this useful for you in this moment so there are times when having a bit of realism is exactly what you need and there are other times when being a bit more fanciful and imaginative or positive is good too so you just need to choose what's appropriate for you uh and if you spend a lot of time being realistic you, you can see a darker side of the world which is probably not that good for you but equally just being positive all the time is, is not a, not a smart move either so there were some other questions going on uh yeah so i was saying some of the best uh tips for retention that i've seen are in darren books darren brown's book tricks of the mind uh, also, if you're interested in another uh, slightly more academic book um, by Robert Diltz, it's called Dynamic Learning. There's lots of really good stuff there about how people learn. Um, and particularly what's interesting about uh, Robert's book is he used to have dyslexia uh, and he doesn't anymore. And he talks about how he, he uh, got over it and um, the studies he's done on how he can teach people, or how you can, one can teach people to recover from dyslexia. And he says an interesting thing. He says... Uh, uh, I was kind of disappointed when I was at school because pretty much every class I was doing well you know people were saying uh, you know Robert you know your creativity around uh, building things with blocks is amazing you know really great and in drawing is a good artist I said oh your creativity creative drawing is brilliant he said they didn't seem to feel the same about his creative spelling in English <laughs> and it really calls on the fact that in any kind of language there's just a set of rules that are made up about why one letter should be in this order next to the other one unless you know those rules you're not going to spell very well 
and very often the way they teach spelling is is rule based but not in a very easy way if you've ever tried to help your kids to learn the, the, the rule sets are really complicated like this sound ie always makes this sound apart from when there's a j before it or a, a z at the end or and sometimes it doesn't even follow that rule so uh, there are better ways as many of you know who are watching this on how to resolve uh, problems with spelling and recall but check out their books it's worth reading <coughs> hopefully darren will um, send me some royalties as a result of that plug I doubt it. So what we're going to do, I said I was going to talk more about people, uh, dealing with other people, but we haven't got time to do that um, in the depth that I wanted to, um, but because you've sent in some really interesting questions. But I will talk about a couple of things, I think. I think the, I'm going to talk more about the drama triangle next time, which is when people, which comes from, kind of transactional analysis it looks at are people stepping into uh, the role of being a victim being a perpetrator or being a rescuer and i talk about that next time because it's a really interesting conversation it'll take a little bit longer than we have today <clears throat> but i would say probably the most important thing you can do if you're dealing with other people and this is not just in interpersonal relationships but if we look at the biggest system occurring in the states is to be able to step in somebody else's shoes, to really take a few moments to kind of go, well, what's going on for them? To try and understand what motivates them, what's what's driving them, what is their intention behind what they're doing? So that we can start to create some kind of more useful dialogue. And in the bigger picture, like in, in the, the tension racial tension in the states that's very true but it's equally true of any interpersonal relationships going on in your life where there's any friction or conflict what will what will be happening is one or probably both of you will be very positional about your own point of view which is completely reasonable it's what we do but as soon as we stay in this is the way it is this is the way it is and we have two very different versions of the world there will be conflict what we need to do instead is to spend a little bit of time getting a sense of what is it like for them? What's going on for them? Why is it this way? Coming back to the positive and realistic conversation, coming from this position that, well, maybe there is good reason for them doing this behavior, even though I can't get it, I, I don't understand it for myself. Maybe there's good reason for it. When you think about it, everything that you've ever done in your life you've done probably for good reason yeah? based on the information available what you thought was going on the skill set that you had your understanding of the world we don't make decisions to mess up we don't make decisions to make life tough for ourselves we we think the decisions we're making at that moment are the best thing we could do now later in hindsight often we can go oh, we shouldn't done that that way but at the time it would have felt like yeah that that was the right thing to do at that time so as we look back at it we may go that wasn't the right thing to do but at the time we, we wouldn't have made a different decision what if we brought some of that kindness and compassion to other people who seem to be doing stuff that's not that great that's quite destructive to just pause for a minute and think okay there's probably a good reason for this you know based on probably flawed logic and misunderstandings of the world but there's probably a good reason for it so uh, understanding somebody else's depression it's difficult to put yourself in in their head it, it is a bit um particularly if you're close to them but if you know, as practitioners we work a lot of people with depression the structure of depression the way of thinking people have around depression is very very clear and very very well structured it's just not very it's not a very happy way of thinking about things they you know mostly look at the future and go what's the point in that it's nothing nothing to look forward to uh best of my life is behind me that's an another thing they often talk about they talk about i wish we could turn back the clock and it could be like it was so they're kind of not living not really engaging in what is really occurring and then they feel massively disempowered like there's nothing i can do about it so very passive in it so what's the point anyway? And sometimes to put the, chip, the icing on the cake, they can run the pattern of 
and also I'm not worth it anyway which is a kind of classic depression statement if you put all those together if, if you imagine running that pattern you know thinking the best of your life is over there's nothing to look forward to uh, you probably don't deserve anything good anyway in your life and the future is empty and hopeless then if, if you try that on for a minute it's, a, it's a, like a bad suit of clothes you'll know what that feels like uh, and, and many people have had a moment of that in their lives hopefully not for long periods of time but you know bad days when you have that feeling that's that's the structure of depression and interesting it points us towards what you need to do to undo that which is to start focusing on what is good in the future why you do deserve a good future and uh you know really a really simple technique to start the ball rolling is for people in the morning and this actually kind of locks it links into lockdown as well in the morning to go what am i looking forward to today now in lockdown where people's days are often the same as the groundhog day that it was before and there's nothing really to look forward to people can get quite depressed because there's no purpose there's no there's no no thing to do so what you need to do is generate a thing to do to kind of go right this is what i'm looking forward to today and then at the end of the day very often look back with gratitude and go this is what i did i'm pleased about uh jenny says lost the idea about forgiving people for making poor decisions when they were best ones the person could make at the time yeah, and then telling that forgiveness on ourselves. Well, when you think about it, I mean, just all these things that we've done, we go, oh, I can't believe I did that. You know, we've got to <laughs> we look remorsefully and regretfully at that point in time. But actually, we couldn't have made any different decision. You know, the classic example of this is the guy who um, was hiking in Colorado and he fell in a ravine and a boulder pinned in one of his arms to the the floor and he couldn't move and he had a, a bit of water but not enough water to, to stay forever and he called out and he called out and he called out nobody came and he got to the point where um he he knew he had a pen knife in his pocket and he had to make a call on do i chop my arm off or do i die and you know the right decision if you want to live is to chop your arm off so that's what he did now if he's just finished sawing through his arm and 10 minutes later a helicopter appears, he still actually made the right choice based on the fact, you know, he only had seconds to live. He needed to do that. So even in extreme circumstances, having that thought, maybe people are doing the best they could do. It, you know, given a different set of cards, different day, different resources, different experiences, different childhoods. Yeah, maybe they'd be different, but that's not, they are what they are, you know. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a kinder way to think about people. Okay, so uh, to finish with, uh, I'm going to, because people have told me they really enjoy uh, my uh, guided uh, visualizations, um, meditations, and stories, uh, we're going to do one on being really calm. If you have trained with me and you've done the master's course particularly, then you can listen to this on at least three different levels. So what I'd like you to do, if you're driving a car, switch off the video. <laughs> if you're having to be responsible for something, switch off the video, watch it later. But if it's safe and reasonable for you to do so, then settle back in your chair. I'm gonna, I think we'll go to the waterfall. There we go. <clears throat> now we've got the music on. Hopefully the volume is about right today. Um, I can't even hear the piano. Oh, there it comes. If there is a problem with the volume, if it's too loud, then do let me know. But what I'd like you to do is just listen to the sound of my voice and allow your unconscious mind to bring something that you would like to feel more relaxed, calm and peaceful about if you have something. Or if you just generally think, oh, I'd like to have the benefits of relaxing and feeling calm now. Because, of course, you feeling calm has many positive benefits to your health. So when you are calm, now the research very clearly says 
at being calm reduces your stress hormones and allows you to boost your immune system, put it back into balance, get your nervous system in a bit of better state. So for whatever reason you're wanting to become more relaxed, just allow yourself to begin by breathing. Breathing deeply. As you listen to a story I've told many times before, because often people need to remember how to become more relaxed and Claire thinking about relaxing in this way will just flow into stepping back into the normal world because the more relaxed you are through your day the easier it is to be relaxed in any given situation so just practicing relaxing is a really good step to that so as i say i often help people to relax because for many people becoming deeply relaxed is something that they need to be more skilled at more practiced at and i remember i was walking with some very very good friends of mine we went on a long walk all the way up the north east coast of Britain on a high pathway one day on the top of the Pennines we could see both down that way and that way all the way to the coast and inland and it was a beautiful day you know one of those magical days where sun shines colours are just so and we walked so far that it was quite late by the time we made camp and there was something about having walked so far and being exhausted how good it felt as I ate that meal looked at the stars talked I had that feeling of really being at peace and I went on many adventures with these friends of mine over the years I remember one day waking up on a beautiful summer's morning hearing the birds I was staying in Bristol And the journey today was going to take us on a footpath down by the Severn River. So we prepared. I'd come all the way from London. Another friend had come from Nottinghamshire. Someone else had come from Essex. And we prepared our journey. Started out. You know that feeling you have when you start a new adventure not quite sure what's going to be around the corner but you're excited about what it could be and you have that feeling of intrigue confidence and relaxation and it was one of those just beautiful five mornings where again the colors the sky sounds just set out this path before us that was so beautiful to see that as we wandered talking enjoying the experience of our company and that amazing sense of freedom you get by being in nature 
no particular schedule to keep to. You can just go at your own pace. And how wonderful that can feel to enjoy those increasing feelings of deepening relaxation. But of course, part of you might be wondering why it is that I've been taking you on this journey down memory lane to places that I went to. Well, it turns out that your unconscious mind is listening all the time to the words spaces in between the words and understanding the meaning of the communication at a deeper level than you might ever have imagined. And this allows you to sink further into memories you have of times when you felt deeply calm and relaxed. And I don't know, as you allow yourself easily and comfortably to now re-immerse yourself in these particular feelings of this beautiful, relaxing place that you can choose from your past of a time when you felt deeply calm and relaxed or maybe to float into the future to what it feels like five maybe ten years from now where this is all behind us it all seems like a dim and distant memory and we've navigated these times successfully and found ourselves to be more of who we are, more at peace, kinder, more knowing. Just through the experience of time and by applying ourselves to these events in a new way that allows us to recognize somewhere deep inside that we do have even more resources on board than we might ever have imagined. Maybe it reminds us of other times in our lives where we've had to deal with unexpected change and what we learnt, what we understood about ourselves, how we flourished and thrived, and the wisdom that we gained allowed us to move forwards into a different future in a different way, as a slightly better, more developed version of the self that we were before because in every experience you always learn there's always something for you to take away that's of value that allows you to be more of who you know at your best you can be and if you are to Take that sense of being your best, which shows up in so many places in your life, and to bring it to those areas of your life where you'd like to be even more the you that you want to be. Just notice what this feels like. To connect with this best you. 
the bit of you you're most pleased with, proud of, that you like the best, and to be that everywhere. And so when you're ready, you can allow yourself to slowly and comfortably bring yourself back with a renewed sense of what's important for you, what you need to focus on. Connecting with all the things you heard, you understood, to allow your future to be moving in a whole new way. And so, as you come back to the room, allow yourself to breathe deeply, notice what you've learnt from that experience. Post it as a comment, let me know. What's that like for you to go on that journey? How's that affected how you feel about yourself? How's that affected how you feel about the forthcoming weeks? How's that change how you deal with the environment that you're in, the people that you're around, your behaviors, skills, beliefs about yourself, who you are and probably most importantly what you can contribute to others just drop us a little note in the comments let me know how that's different for you as you do that if you're interested in more of the seminars and also more of the skills that I've been talking about particularly around relaxation then if you go to this page, philparker.org forward slash health, which will come around again in a second, there's a link to a relaxation de-stress program I'd really recommend if you're interested in this kind of stuff. So just go again to philparker.org forward slash health if you're interested in that. And of course, we'll be back next Tuesday, 6 p.m. So look forward to seeing you then. You take care now.